So uh, in case you didn't know, we're, we're going to talk about telepresence robots and how they can make video calls much more engaging and how using TalkBox APIs if, with your existing apps or future apps or apps you didn't even know you thought you were going to come up with yet, uh, you can as well. So just to give you a little introduction to uh, our team and the creators. So I'm Marcus Rosenthal, CEO and co-founder of Revolve Robotics. Yeah, and I'm uh, Ilya Polyakov. I'm the CTO and co-founder. And um, here is uh, Tim. He's our web ops and web front end dev, um, <laughs> enjoying the fruits of his labor. And uh, <laughs> Oliver, uh, who couldn't be here tonight, even on a Kubi, uh, he's kind of our mechatronics and mobile mobile guru. He's here in spirit. Yes. <laughs> um, so Kubi's really, we're changing the face of robotics and where there's lots of different, um, especially telepresence robots and different platforms that are starting to utilize video to allow people to come in, have a remote presence or do different types of recording and, and those types of things. And what we've chosen to focus on with Kubi is really the ability to look around. And Kubi actually, as I said, means neck in Japanese. And that's what it does. It gives you that same capability as having a neck. And so we felt that that is the right approach to telepresence, to giving people that kind of interaction. And the platform is all leveraged off, like the opportunity that Ilya and I saw where we said, hey, let's create a product around this was when mobile devices and specifically tablets progressed along far enough that they could become the main computing power of a robot so that you could have this is all the difficult and expensive stuff and then you make a simple platform that um, you know can connect to that um, and control it and we'll tell you more about um, you know, all of those aspects of Kubi um, shortly. Um, but we really want you, and I want everyone, you know, even if you're not a developer, um, and I know I talked to even a couple of people right before this, sounds like they were thinking about startups related to robotics. And through this presentation, think about how you could integrate Kubi into the video applications and video applications that are using TalkBox uh, today. There's lots of opportunities there, like we'll point out a few specific market verticals that we think there's huge opportunities to create customized applications. So we have an API available and it works all within the TalkBox uh, infrastructure. And so why do people need Kubi? Um, it's the physical presence. It's you being able to control from absolutely anywhere in the world your presence somewhere else and where you look and have situational awareness, but then also have people recognize you as an individual. So here's Tim. You see Tim. Uh, you're not thinking about, oh, can he see me? Um, who's he looking at? I know he's looking at you guys right now. Um, he can look at me if he wants. What's up, Tim? He's, he's an individual, he's right there. That's <laughs> extremely powerful and that completely changes how I communicate with Tim because he's not like over there, he's, he's right here. Um, and his face is nice and big on this tablet that Apple was amazing enough to design for us and spend billions designing. Um, um, and so what we decided to do is don't build up a system from scratch. Don't, uh, don't come up with your own computer system. Move the whole thing, move the tablet, not a peripheral camera, where the camera on the tablet looks, the screen looks as well. It's just this monolithic thing. It's almost comical in nature, but it works just so well. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and here's Tim controlling it remotely. Um, the other thing this lets you do and in some cases even lets you be in several places at once. Uh, like this is, our, this is our web interface. You can see we have several locations. So you could literally jump from one place to another instantly. So not only is Tim right here, he could be you know, connected to Spain at the same time or jump from here to Spain uh, or jump to another room in this space without driving there. 
So that's a big difference from driving robots uh, in our product. Um, we also added a lot of cool things like saved views so he can look at me and like he memorizes that he's looking at me and then he could save a position to look at you guys. Um, and then just on the hardware itself, the way we designed the tablet mount, uh, when we were designing this originally, <laughs> okay, lock stop em, moving for a em. second. You can lock them. <laughs> oh yeah, I could. Hold on. Um, sometimes it's not good to be in charge of your remote presence. Um, when we designed this originally, you know, the iPad mini wasn't even out. Um, the lightning connector wasn't even out. We designed this thing two and a half years ago, which is like a century in mobile device world. So we designed it to fit just about any size tablet. So you can fit portrait, landscape. Um, you could fit the phablets. You could fit anything up to a Microsoft Surface. Um, Hold on. <laughs> um, and that's, that's been amazing because we, when the iPad mini came out, we just dropped it in. Uh, there wasn't even a software change because it's all Bluetooth low energy controlled. So just download the app, drop in a new tablet, and it magically works. <laughs> He's showing you uh, the, the, yeah, the nod, head shake, bow gestures yeah. that we got. <laughs> it's that magic. Uh, but then the other thing we did too, because we didn't quite know how people were going to be using this, we designed it to be modular, not just up here, but down here as well. So at the bottom is a tripod mount that you could bolt this thing onto uh, gorilla pods. You could bolt it onto tripods. Uh, we're designing uh, robotic arms that this can go onto. And yeah, you can even bolt it onto a wheeled platform, but we're just religiously against that right now out of principle because this is what we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we've also added an expansion port to the underside that brings out the servo control chain, uh, brings out an I-squared C channel so that you could run accessories. You could put it on a, on a hexapod robot and walk it around if you wanted to. Um, or you could put it on a wheeled platform and control the wheeled platform through the app, through our Bluetooth module, down into, into the rest of the robot body. So it's really treating the physical robot as a peripheral. It's no different than a fitness tracker. It's no different than a smart light bulb, but it's this physical thing that can move. Um, and that's, that's been a lot of fun. We've done cool stuff with it. Um, Tim has made one of these uh, ring a gong. Um, you could put a Nerf gun on it. We welcome people to try to put a Nerf gun on it. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we're using this for a lot of stuff, Marcus. Yeah, so, so talking about some of the different applications, I mean, literally, we kind of went out there expecting it was gonna get used one way and more, it, starts getting bought like we didn't even expect it was going to get used in education at all and they're one of our top markets in fact and but whole host of interesting different applications but these are the three main ones so for telecommuters who are doing remote working uh, education and, and telemedicine and I'll walk through a few case studies of some specific customers that have done some pretty novel things um, so the first one, and this one we never had any idea that this would even exist as um, something, but is, is virtual receptionists. And more and more companies are going and, you know, try to, to save money and costs. They just have kind of a empty lobby with, you know, a, 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 maybe a phone where you can call the people or it says, you know, dial them up with your cell phone. <laughs> Um, and so, but Lucas Therapies are a physical therapy chain in uh, Virginia, and they wanted to still have that interactive presence with their, um, with their customers. And so they went, and, and it was something actually their, their founder had dreamt up for a while, and, and then they learned about Kubi, and they're like, this is perfect for it. And so they, they actually were one of the ones really uh, pressing our, the integration that we did with TalkBox, they were pushing some of the limits of it. And still today, they're, we look and, you know, they're almost eight to 10 hours a day that they're just all logged in all day on the Kubis. And so they have now um, four offices where there's four reception areas that are just staffed by two people. 
and so that one each one of them is able to watch two locations and at that same time they in all the downtime that a reception normally has they're able to be doing other work so it's not that they're a dedicated receptionist anymore um, and we've even implemented some features like Tim had used it earlier like they're uh, text display feature so like if they're supporting one person they don't want to be like talking to one at another location so they'll mute and black out their screen and it'll say oh, please hold on I'll be with you in a moment um, but they've actually since December have been checking in over a hundred patients a day uh, to their four locations solely through Kubi so they don't have anyone up there um, and this has all been powered by our Kubi video app um, which, which is integrated and powered by TalkBox. So. Um, then looking at another one, uh, this one has pr been pretty fun actually. They were one of our earliest customers. They even in fact got our hacker edition. Um, and and uh, this is Etsy. And so of course in their Etsy fashion, they've uh, decorated up their, their Kubis with some different interesting puppets that we're actually talking with them that maybe we'll refer our customers that they can go to their Etsy sellers and get those in the near future. But it started out as a, as a hacker project by Corey on the left there that, you know, they, they allow them to do different, he was actually the office hacker, so he was specifically trying to do different hack technologies in the office. And so he brought the Kubi in, he hacked with some of our APIs and a few different things, and now they've uh, brought it in and I, I was actually at their office in, in Brooklyn um, two weeks ago and walking around their office it was an office just like this and it was just kooby 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 and people all over the place logged into them and that's just so that now all their remote teams can have um, good interaction and, and, and talk to each other so that, that's a, a pretty fun one and they have I think eight different offices and there's some staggered all over that do that. Um, and then uh, this is another one, uh, Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. And um, you know, they, they're, uh, they're also using it for uh, office collaboration. Um, and, and this is, uh, you know, they, they've said that they actually are saving now $1,000 per meeting because they can have as good of an interaction as they needed. Um, with being face to face, and th this actually uh, shows here. This 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 is showing FaceTime with our uh, Kubi Control app, um, and that's kind of where we started. That's that was the interface before uh, we did the integration with Talkbox, and Ilya will talk a little bit more about that transition and why it's so much better, uh, you know, with the integration uh, after this. But um, you know, they have. Quite a few Kubis for that a variety of the remote workers will uh, just log into each one. Um, and then this one, everyone usually sees this picture and it's just kind of mind blowing. It's like we often get like questions like, well, what do I do if there's multiple people, you know, in a conference? How, how do you do it? Like, are you supposed to put Kubis on both ends? Well, this, this is. Uh, at Michigan State University, they have a hybrid learning class, and, and this is actually the third semester of it, where um, they've explored a number of different technologies. Like they looked at more of a traditional video conference where they had just a big screen with an array of people, and they said it just didn't provide the type of engaging interaction that they needed to have to have. This is a graduate course where they wanted to have a very interactive um, discussion. And so now the remote students can really participate. So they're not just sitting there watching through a camera or listening through a speakerphone. They can turn to the teacher, ask questions. They can see what's going on in the class. Um, and, and they coined a phrase, uh, discernible attention, which basically what that means is that you can see where someone is, is placing their attention. Like right now I know Tim is looking toward the audience. So you can see like these students, their attention is right now toward the professor and if they want to turn somewhere else. And, and it's even pretty interesting. Those students have said that they can look at, you know, other, either other Kubis or other students in the class and use them almost as a beacon that it's like, okay, 
Tim probably knows that I'm talking right now just by looking at all of you because your attention is pointed at me. Um, and, and their real goal is, is to deliver a comparable learning to these uh, remote students, to online students. Um, and so within this, like there's actually, we have lots of different ideas of how our API with the talk box can be really like customized to create solutions specifically for this market. Yes. So what does each of those students at the other remote end have to make this work? The, just the laptop. Huh? It's just a laptop. And how do they control movement by keyboard or something? Or? Yeah, yeah, so you we'll can, show that off. Huh? Yeah, we'll show that in a few minutes. Okay. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so you, you can just click, um, click with your mouse, control with the keyboard arrow keys, or even with the presets, just save it with numbered and positions. Yeah, so they can turn toward each other and have a conversation. It's kind of mind blowing when you see like a Kubi looking toward a Kubi. But yeah, each one of them, they're not on like a multi, they're not on like a WebEx or something like that. They're each dialed in just to that Kubi and they're hearing just through the microphone of the Kubi and the, the audio is projected through the speaker. So that poses its own challenges and some customers connect in, you know, like little speaker phones like that. And there's some other more elaborate setups that people do as they get to larger um, situations. Um, and then looking at telemedicine and telemedicine is just booming right now. It's like the one of the largest growing fields that we're seeing, especially in a, the video conferencing space. Um, and like one of the ones that has a tremendous growing need is with the aging population is for home care and elderly care and we've recently been researching more into those markets and the numbers are kind of astounding um, and and so this this is like a home care setting where a nurse practitioner has gone into the home of a patient one of our customers and they they bring a doctor in um, you know, remotely on the Kubi, so the nurse can, you know, take some of the different uh, vital signs and then the doctor can give his consultation uh, based on that without physically going there. And there's a whole trend of like even going to eliminating the, the nurse practitioner from coming there and you have different sensing devices. Um, so like lots of opportunity around that to integrate with different connected, you know, heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, scopes. Yes, question? So you talked about the opportunities to tell this. Learning what successful cases you had yet. Um, so, I mean, so we're in at least 50 different hospitals, so, uh, and we're in probably about four home care organizations. Um, the, uh, there, there's, I'm trying to, make sure I only say the names of ones that I'm allowed to publicly say <laughs> that, that there's a number, but Dartmouth-Hitchcock is one um, where we've uh, published a case study with them. Um, Chojin's Hospital um, in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah, I guess um, I'm what is the value yeah. Um, so, so the value proposition is that you can really bring in a doctor and they can have an engaging presence with those um, patients. And so they can turn and look and interact with them. And like in a home care setting, um, like, like some of uh, our customers there, they, they want to be able to log in. We have actually an auto answer feature. So they could see if, like, if somebody is passed out on the floor. If, if I just had a Kubi here on a stand and there's somebody laying on the floor over there, you can't see that. <laughs> uh, the reason I'm asking is that I spent the last few years in Elvis and I was thinking about what I used to be able to do with Elvis. Oh, okay. So I used to be able to touch my last role with my innovations. Okay. So I know the space pretty well. And uh, when you say 50 hospitals, I'm actually quite impressed. Um, I'm trying to figure out exactly what value problems are between them. Because having been in Elvis for so long, and I've uh, sold the Oh, 
do that, that Yeah. So, I, I mean, some, it, it's really coming in and mainly bringing that video engagement. That's, that's the part that, that, that at this point, and we're planning more in the future to integrate with other devices, but at this point, we talk to many, many doctors that just bring in iPads and tablets, and, and, and they're setting it up. And so those are the ones where it now amplifies that to another level of uh, engagement, is that, that they're not just a static. Yeah. But there's still mobility to that. So, so on, they go from place to place, and they're never standing still. So I'm trying to figure out. I, I see the home care because our company, or well, my last company, started off with home care. Um, I, I was one of the first to be employees in that company. But the vision initially was home care. You know, yeah. Could you go into home care? Could you uh, do you know, the LPATs? Could you? And it was never cost effective. So I'm wondering could you really hone in on that instead of going to hospitals? Because hospitals is quite chaotic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the problem with the elderly care is that they're not very tech savvy in there. It's yeah. a very competitive market and well, it, it, it's there's a low barrier to entry because anyone here could go start taking care of their elderly parents and you know and, and that but what's what's opened up the opportunity in telemedicine I don't have a picture of it, but we've created what's called a kubi cart and it's nothing more than a push around a, you know a passive cart but you can take and put the kubi on there and so now that's something very familiar in the hospital and like so we have a deployment that's just starting to go out that's for interpretation services in the, in the hospital and so they're putting um, a couple kubis in there that then anytime someone needs interpretation it goes and gets rolled in there and that's it's it's really about looking at what types of services you know don't need to you know either zoom in a hundred times to you know see someone's eyeball you know so more like behavioral health interpretation um, you know some of those kinds of services so it is certainly um, we want to match it up, and w I, I really want to talk with you more after this. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we'll probably move yeah. on so we don't keep yeah. here everyone too Sorry. long. <laughs> so <laughs> it's so, gonna go in this more of the yeah. So I'll, I'll get to the to the nitty gritty of our apps. So when we first started out as a startup, you know, you're limited in resources and what you can do. So we didn't want to recreate the wheel and uh, come up with our own video client and come up with our own video conferencing. So we came up with the Kubi Control app, which was uh, an app that ran in the background that listened for uh, commands from the web and just controlled the motion of the Kubi. And in the foreground, you would have another uh, video conferencing app. You know, we started out using FaceTime and Skype. Um, you can use any app running in the foreground, really. And that was really good for like going to an organization that says, oh, we use, we use video with a YO at the end. Um, does your device work with us? Yes, of course it does. You use our app in the background. Now the challenge it creates is that on the controlling side, um, you need to have essentially two windows. You need to have a web browser open to do the, the, the controls and you need to have a separate window um, for the video conferencing. We actually usually ended up loading up the controls on, um, on a web browser on a phone and using it as like a remote control and then you have your video conferencing on another screen. But most normal non-Bay Area people can't even deal with two apps. So we had a lot of problems with it. Um, and so, because uh, this, this is what it actually looked like, right? You have your web browser open in one side, you have your video window open on right next to it and like a lot of people actually have trouble physically arranging their windows to be alongside each other that neatly for most of us in the bay area it's like a not no-brainer but it's a problem um so we um we came up with kubi video and this is where talkbox was just amazing in that we took the talkbox open api we uh, took what we learned from the previous Kubi control app uh, in terms of the front end uh, UI and the controls and the Bluetooth connection and we rolled the two together. So now you have a single control app uh, and video app in one where you have on-screen controls. You just click where you want to look and it will move um, to look where you just clicked. Uh, it's a single data pipe so there's, uh, there's a lot less firewall issues a lot of our enterprise customers are very sensitive to the to you know how many ports you have open um, and on the kubi side there's just a single app so you launch an app it's active it listens to the to to the web and it just goes um, it's been a lot more straightforward this is kind of what it looks like there's jeff um, happily attending a trade show on on a kubi uh, and there's uh there's there's uh the talk box guys there uh, talking to them, and this, this is what the WebRTC interface looks like. Um, there's kind of your standard call buttons. There's these sliders. This is for this is for tilt. This is for pan. These are the different kind of waypoints that are saved, um, and that you could revisit. And then what this doesn't show, and it's a little hard to to convey it. without um, showing a demo you click anywhere on the screen. So if I click here, it will move and center on where I just clicked. So Mark is so, going to try yeah. to boot up a demo. Yeah, we'll just give you a quick demo of it so you can actually experience it. So this, this all runs just straight in a browser. It's just kubivideo.me. We're logged in here. Um, and uh, so this is actually the Kubi network list. So this is all the different ones. I'm going to get out of the direct view. Um, and so green means it's available. The talk rex is what uh, Tim's logged into, so it's red. And so literally, I can just click here, and it's just a link. So basically, it's a each Kubi has their own URL. And now we've just logged in. So we're this is San Francisco, you know, over at our office in Dogpatch. And the way you control it is just click to center. So wherever I click, so I'll click over on this yellow thing on the wall here. And then it adjusts the view, and that's now the center. And I can click back Save View here, so then it's going to save that one. And now say I'll come back to center right on this Kubi, and I can save a view there. And it's as easy as just clicking this, and it moves back to that other position, or I can even just push a numbered key and push number two there. Um, and then using these sliders, and this is kind of fun. We have actually a mirror 
over here to the left so you can see uh, anyone can see you know what they look like I guess oh, kind of bright there um, <laughs> but but so there's me you know on a mirror we say oh you, anyone can take a selfie of what they look like in the Revolve Robotics office so it's it's that easy to control and you can also use the arrow keys and these are pretty neat they're time sensitive so I just, if I just want to do like little moves I just tap it or if I want to do a bigger move I press and hold and then it moves quite a bit more um, and so and we put you know full controls you can turn on and off your speaker and video and here's where you can display a message to the screen like what Tim was doing earlier um, so a whole host of different things and then if I want to teleport to somewhere else I just literally click on that one this one is also in our office not too far from that same one but uh, oh no actually this one's looking out the window is that one set to uh, private mode right now? I don't know. It's going? Is it going? Go, we might go, have go. not plugged it in. <laughs> it might be unplugged. So do you have to want to take a data comparing this to a passive state? With particular applications? I'm sure that passive state in terms of? Passive stand. Uh, in terms of usefulness? Yes. Um, yeah. uh, so one of the things we're doing that's really cool is we're collecting analytics on uh, actually everything, the duration of the call, how many degrees per call you move, um, even which UI elements you're using to, to initiate the moves. And we can actually judge what the application is based on like your movement behaviors, but we do see people using this a lot. We see people moving um, miles. <laughs> but we're, we're aware of at least three different universities who've done actually fairly extensive studies around having, yeah, like, I mean, Xerox Park had done it and a few different universities and some even started bringing in Kubi where they were comparing, you know, having this kind of interaction, you know, they were kind of pre-Kubi or even pre-tablet some of them, but just having where a screen that could move around, I mean, I don't know how many of you saw the movie Demolition Man, but there's a scene in there in the conference room where there's a bunch of like screen, there's only one person in person and he's walking around and all the screens are turning and following him. You know, so these, the concepts have kind of been out oh, yeah. for a while, um, but yeah, there's definitely been some research that shows that interaction really helps improve engagement. For sure. I mean, the, ultimately, the, the thing that proves it to us is we have customers that are using this for 10 hours a day. And they're using it for 10 hours a day and moving. They're, they're moving the thing around all the time. Um, and more telling than that, when our service goes down, we get a lot of calls <laughs> from those people. So people definitely miss it. <laughs> and we try and minimize how much it does go yes. down. <laughs> <laughs> between stationary stationary and moving yeah um, just from personal experience being now being used to doing this whenever I Skype with somebody it, it feels like I'm wearing like a neck brace when when I can't move the other camera it's it's very constricting it's very confining because I'm so used to having that independence and it's really about that that emotion of independence uh, on both sides and so um, to talk about specifically what we did to make the SAP work. Um, TalkBox has this really nice SDK that takes care of video and audio. Uh, and there is a, a data channel available. So we're using that TalkBox data channel to send our text messages, but also send the motion commands. And so we took our Kubi uh, web front end um, kind of UI collection of widgets and laid that over the standard WebRTC um, talk box stuff. Uh, we did set up a, an authentication server to initiate the calls as well, and that's that location management um, that you guys saw. Uh, and then on the app side, we had our uh, Kubi uh, mobile SDK that has the Bluetooth connection um, and the, the serial communication stuff figured out. So you just talk to core Bluetooth from your app and send it commands in the right format and it'll move the Kubi. Um, and the initial, the initial kind of proof of concept app took the guys less than a week. Uh, granted, then we had to do a whole thing of, well, how do you get, how do you get your grandma to use it and not, not get lost and go over the, the UX um, and kind of the features that people need. 
uh, but ultimately it was very quick. And what's really cool is everything we did for the Kubi web uh, front end controls uh, and the mobile SDK, that's all available. So if you wanted to take your mobile app and have it talk to the Kubi and move a Kubi, even if it's not video based, um, you could use our, uh, use our SDK. And then we're also publishing the, um, like that click to position thing that you guys saw. And <laughs> he was um, requesting to be in landscape. Uh, kind of all the, all the little UI things that made that uh, web based control very easy for normal people to use, um, that's all available also for people to integrate. He probably wanted it this and so this is now completely past robotics. This is now software wrapped in plastic. Um, it's most of the advances to make this more palatable to the general world are software. Um, so what we did with Kubi Video is pretty simple, right? We could control the Kubi uh, movement. We set up the user experience and, and the, the flow to be kind of palatable to, to most people. Um, we made the login very simple where you just email somebody a link, they click it, they log in, the thing auto answers. Uh, we did the location management. There is actually a scheduling system that um, you can invite people to scheduled conferences, but then also it's scheduled based security. So for schools, for example, when you want a student to be able to log into a Kubi during only a certain time, um, that's, that's in place. And more extended uh, from that is the security. So you guys saw us uh, log into the Kubi at our office. We didn't actually log in. It just set to auto answer full public mode. It's accessible from our website. But obviously hospitals and schools, more sensitive locations need uh, better security. So we have a couple of options. There's uh, whitelisted uh, security. So whoever is allowed, you specify who's allowed to log into the thing. There's pin number based security. Um, and that's good for like telecommuters and distance learning, uh, remote experts like remote doctors. So it's really good for single person to single location, um, but really to expand from there and especially get into things like elderly care, remote nurses or customer service. You really need things that kind of more typical support infrastructure services have. So you have virtual queues. So let's say you, you're at home and you need help right now. You click on a thing and it goes to the next available operator. So uh, operator queuing and uh, virtual, virtual lines. Uh, also um, for virtual receptionists, like that thing we showed you at Lucas Therapies, there doesn't actually have to be a live person on the thing. You walk in, the screen says hello, you click on a uh, couple of questions and maybe it doesn't go to a live representative uh, until it really has to. You click, okay, now I need help for a live representative and then it connects you. So the Kubi is really kind of the hub of the system that enables um, these applications, but really to make them more extended, uh, there's a lot of cool software stuff you could do. <laughs> Like, and Marcus touched on this too with uh, adding, adding new hardware devices for patient monitoring. So uh, there's a ton of uh, health measuring devices that are Bluetooth and mobile, mobile connected now um, that you can have working in parallel with a Kubi. So you can have a Kubi doing uh, elderly care at home with an oximeter and a blood pressure cuff. Um, all a part of this ecosystem, but this is all stuff that we want to work with partners on. So we want to bring in developers, uh, people with ideas um, to kind of extend the capabilities of this platform because it really, right now, I think we enabled a lot just by being able to be present somewhere, but there's a lot of tools you can, you can add. Yeah, it's like, it's like for like the elderly care um, application, for example, there's a number of companies that are setting up different type of sensing. So you can sense in the home, like if they're still in bed, if they haven't gone to the bathroom in a while, if they took their medications, but they don't have the ability to intervene and interact of like check in and talk to that person. So do you envision in most cases there's one of these only at the one end of the conversation? Mm -hmm. or 
Well, like for example, for elderly care, on one end there's a call center of a hundred nurses. Yeah, usually, like the only time you would need it on both ends is like if you had kind of meeting room to meeting, like group to group uh, sort of interactions. Um, but um, we really see whenever it's like one remote person going in and having their presence, they're usually in front of their camera at their laptop or tablet. So that it's not. It's like I'm a telecommuter. Why do you need to look around my house? You know, it's you don't want like people that. looking around your house. Yeah, so that's the thing. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you went from prototype to actual physical thing that you can sell. The, the actual hardware? Yeah. The scary part, the, the thing we don't talk about? The white robot the in the room? Things that um, come to people come to robot games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, so we kind of optimized for time to market with this thing. And we initially prototyped with Dynamixel, off-the-shelf Dynamixel servos that you can buy, you know, you can buy at Amazon. And initially we laser cut a prototype. We actually saw uh, Etsy using it and that actually became our hacker, hacker edition that we shipped during our crowdfunding campaign. Um, we went through a couple of uh, 3D printed prototypes, um, still completely revolving around that Dynamixel servo. So it's pan and tilt, two servos, and then we made a Bluetooth board. Uh, at the time, BLE wasn't really popular. It was, it was brand new, but we managed to control those servos through BLE and through an iOS app and then extended that over the web. So then we were using push notification to send commands to the Dynamixel servos, which was pretty cool. Um, and then we just kept modifying what was wrapped around these servos to the point where we had custom, you know, 21 custom injection molded parts. Um, we're still using the core of those servos. So even in this unit right here, it's still the gear set and the motors and the motion control out of those servos. The core electronics haven't actually changed from our very first prototype. Um, what that allowed us to do is we actually went from pretty much napkin sketch to shipping fully injection molded parts in about eight months. And um, that allowed us to also start kind of slowly putting these things together in house. So we went from like 50 laser cut prototypes to 100 injection molded prototypes to um, I think we built about 700 robots in house. So you're still making, you haven't gone to a contract manufacturer? So, well, we kind of did. Um, what we did is we, when we're doing this in house, we set up a supply chain, we had an injection molder. We had, this, you know, we had the supply for the gears, and uh, we do have a we have a contract manufacturer up in Petaluma now, but they're using the same exact supply chain. Uh, they're doing it in higher volume, um, so the price is a little bit better. Um, but what was cool because we did this in house first, we set up the the assembly process, we knew what the quality control quirks are, where we you know where we had to focus our attention. Um, we're actually ramped up in Petaluma in two weeks. So from like packing up our assembly line to bringing it out there, they were making stuff two weeks later, which was um, pretty awesome. And so what we're doing right now is we're taking this generation, um, we shipped it off to a contract manufacturer in China. And, but, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's always gonna be the punchline, right? Yes, it's going to China. But what's cool is, and, and I see a lot of startups making this uh, mistake is, you get your product to like 95% design complete and you take it to China and you get into a lot of trouble. So especially stuff that comes out of an industrial design firm, you usually cannot take that to China. It's uh, a lot of bad things happen. So what we're able to do is we literally sent them this design and we sent them a list of this is what we want to fix about this design, these specific things, um, everything else do exactly the same. Even the gear train, the electronics, copy it, modify this, so we know exactly what we're dealing with. It's like, what they're doing, it's only like 2% new, not like 10% new. Um, and I think that's really important. So we have pretty, pretty high confidence right now in what's, what's gonna happen. And it's also shortening our, um, our development time a lot, hopefully. <laughs> Go on. Yeah. <laughs> but you guys can totally ask me more about the hardware after, after this.
Yeah, so just talking a little bit more about our API. So as we said, Kubi Video is all based on TalkBox, which means that anyone who's creating an application with TalkBox can take our same APIs and reference designs and Um, and, and integrate them right into your um, applications. Um, very easy, We've, our, Tim and Oliver have really kind of modularized it so you can pick out which features that you would want to integrate. And like some of our partners have integrated into their um, applications in literally within hours or days, that it's not like they need to spend months and months because we already created these APIs. And so you could take the TalkBox ones as well as ours and put them literally into any platform, iOS, Android, web. And that's our, uh, where our API is available, so api.kubivideo.me. Um, so we like to pose it to anyone that let you know what, what's that next app that could be there. So it's, it's Kubi and your TalkBox application. Like, you know, this, this photo here is actually um, one of our uh, customers and partners who, this was him actually presenting live on stage. It was at a conference, I think it was down in Monterey, and he was out over in Maryland, and, you know, just novel things like that are now able to happen. I've, I've probably presented in like six different places around the world now at this point, from Australia to Indiana to New York. <laughs> Uh, this same sort of way. We'll just send a Kubi there, and then you know you obviously have to have someone to set it up. And often what we'll do is is mirror that you know with with a Apple TV or HDMI cable, and you can even be big on the screen too, but you can still look around. Yes. How much does one of these cost? Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Kubis are, uh, the MSRP is $599. Amazon? Amazon, they're a little less. <laughs> um, and, and we have um, bulk discounts. So like for companies that are bringing like whole networks of Kubis, we have a variety of different uh, bulk discounts when they're implementing them for their whole office. Is your part of the software so our, uh, the thing that takes data from coming in from the web and pipes it out to Bluetooth to our device, it's completely open, yeah. So you can, you can sign up on our, on our website at yeah, I'll put the, it back. the API, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on api.kubivideo.me and um, you can play with it. We've had people do animated characters, um, just all sorts of cool stuff with it. Yeah, Twitter was doing something where they were like. Oh yeah, they had a Periscope integration. Yeah, based on like um, tweets, it was you could like, <laughs> you could send a tweet and it would like, make it do a certain gesture. <laughs> it, it just seems like maybe the um, barriers to competitors seem kind of low. There must be a bunch of learning though to make it work. There's, it yeah, there's there's a lot, and I, I'd say, um, be, being the CTO, the biggest. Uh, learning curve, the steepest learning curve has been um, the user experience and making a, a complex robot palatable to, to normal, to like a teacher in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, like somebody asked me, I was telling somebody else here earlier today, somebody asked me on a, on a sales call, do you need internet on both sides? Like these are the people you're selling a robot to. <laughs> So it's not, that this is, and this is why we don't talk about the hardware that much. It's, it's software wrapped in plastic. Mm -hmm. It's the hardware is like the least of your problems when, when trying to sell a robot. So you have a little board in there that takes low power Bluetooth? Yep. And runs a couple of motors? Yep. Could run a few more? Yep. Uh, are there competing products that you can take that out and sell that as a, as a? As a standalone, oh. just a piece of hardware? Yeah, of the board. Um, I mean, maybe there's something on the market already. Uh, there's there's boards and actually I've being being a roboticist like yeah I've been wanting to just sell the board because it's really cool. We have an ongoing debate. About yes, we have an ongoing debate about for this. That or not. <laughs> and like as as a startup, right? It's what you don't do that's more important actually than what you end up doing because yeah. you could do so many things. Like we could take this board and we could market it. We could set up a table at the make fair, right. 
and um, but really, like I'd rather have Kaiser like buy a thousand of these yeah. things or <laughs> thousands of these. When you have a six-person startup, oh. <laughs> you know that's that's what it comes down to. Because you got to remember, this piece of hardware, all the software you see here, this was a technical team of three people and some contractors. <laughs> um, realistically, without such a modular ecosystem, that would, that would not be possible with so few resources. But because there's the TalkBox stuff, and then there's our module, and actually even the Bluetooth module itself that we're using, it's, it's based on a TI chip, but it is a module with its own scripting language that we didn't have to do the low-level stuff on. So we just took these building blocks and made made a robot. So I don't even think of it as a as as like hardware. It's it's software. We could just license it to somebody. Else. Um, yeah. We could. There's really not much to license, though. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that's the funny part about it. It's like so easy to do. Yes. Uh, USB power, but it's got a it's got a four hour battery. Four hour built in yeah, yeah, so and the whole videos. the whole idea is that this lives somewhere and then if you wanted to take it to the kitchen or you wanted to take it to a different conference room you can but it's not designed as a battery powered device really but like our customers that's not how it's designed to live so that's why we didn't make it an eight hour battery life it's designed to live somewhere and like it lives on your table plugged in, plugged in. so it has like it's place where you keep it charged and most of our customers in fact are leaving it in one place and they leave the cables permanently there so they never have to think about charging it and like the telemedicine customers they have it on a cart and usually they'll put an extra battery pack you know just like one that'll charge your cell phone in there and then they can just plug it in at the end of the day the whole cart so I have a related question so if you think about going forward you have a Hardware, robotics is one thing, and you have a uh, kind of teleconferencing, you know, software is another. Which part do you feel more important? What do you want to do more for the next generation of your service? What's, which direction are you going in? <laughs> I mean, like, we feel that, I mean, so, so the, the software is made great because of the hardware so so it's like we don't feel that there needs to be a lot of iteration on our hardware that it's that we've actually built it very robust like we maybe did one firmware update since we yeah. created it I mean, you know there's very little and so it's really it's all about the applications that you can do with the software and so it's like I mean we're constantly thinking of different ones and it's choosing which one do we focus to really build it out for a specific vertical. Yeah, the, the hardware the hardware aspect of it, I mean, yeah, there's gonna be a second generation of the hardware, that's the stuff we're doing in China right now. Make it quieter, make like this specific part a little stronger, because we had a couple of returns due to this breaking. Um, so we learned a lot doing that, but really what's interesting is like, can we set up motion tracking using the onboard camera? Um, can, we, can we integrate this with a hospital, you know, patient data management system. Uh, it's really a software challenge. And yeah. how do we make that easy to use? Head, like, like we work with Plantronics, they have a Bluetooth headset that, that has an accelerometer in it. And so they've done a head motion tracking application, which is pretty cool. So then as you turn your head, it actually turns the remote Kubi, which poses an interesting challenge because if your screen's here and you turn your head, so like obviously it works best if you're like sitting in a swivel chair and holding the tablet but just a number of interesting things like that of every we we design the user interfaces to like have it be a minimum cognitive load for the person who's controlling it so it's just like they don't have to think about controlling it that it just feels natural to be able to yeah an, an yeah. oculus is interesting the only thing is how are you going to show up here because yeah, you can't avatar. get you could be an avatar. Yeah, you yeah. could be an avatar yeah. if you wanted to. But but then you like have like bug eyes. I, I think I think yeah. we're we're at a cool point right now where, and, and this goes back to my my previous life of doing industrial automation because in industrial like factory automation, you very rarely build like when you're installing an assembly line, you very rarely actually build the robots. You integrate. 
you get a lot of different parts from vendors and you, you, your job is to integrate them and put them together. And there's some software that glues it all together and that's actually usually off the shelf too. And you have these very reliable pieces of technology that are made unique by how you combine them. And that's pretty much what we did here. Like we, I, I treat us more as a technology integrator than, um, than a, a designer, than a core technology developer, like both in software and in hardware. Well, so just like top boxes, yeah, one of the, the things top box is one of the things, and we have our own unique building block, which is the the Bluetooth connection. But then like the servos are off the shelf, at least for now, um, and we want to add other blocks like blood pressure monitors and you know IoT uh, room we lights. A question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, this is supposed to be a question. <laughs> He's our marketing guy. Asperger's face facial recognition like diagnosis software. I wonder if anybody here can think of the applications that you know there was a news report on solar product the last two weeks. What was it? Uh, the product was had that kind of a top end, but it was on a application of many videos there were people like walking into a store and having a uh, oh yeah we know those guys uh they're like down in uh they're down in mountain view right yeah yeah that made, yeah. That made 10 minutes on uh, npr uh -huh. news hour. But yeah they, they're working with osh i think right it is, i don't know what they said i thought yeah, lowe's lowe's yeah, lowe's and osh yeah. yeah it's the same we know other people working at retail for a lot yeah yeah we think like that's one where it, it really needs specific software um, created just for it. Like, like uh, I mean, we've talked to some major mall chains and and well, coming the in. Story was about having future having fewer employees in the future. Mm -hmm. the job that's kind of their, their slant on. Yeah, that's that's the me the media really likes to like kind of poke at robots of like, oh, you're eliminating jobs. It's like. It's shifting where the jobs are. You know? I mean, especially with us, if we're it's, if it's we're extending the capabilities of a person, so we can have, you know, somebody in the Midwest in in Detroit, uh, you know, telecommute to another place, or we can have a, a virtual receptionist or a virtual salesperson working in Detroit, you know, manning a store in Palo Alto because the real estate is so expensive in Palo Alto, they can't afford to, you know, store clerks can't afford to live in Palo Alto anymore. Or medical Yeah. Right? Or as the population ages, not enough nurse practitioners to take care of all the old people. So we drop in cooties and they help take care of more people than they could otherwise. Well, I'm not arguing with Pretty impressed with that too. <laughs> so, industries change. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody yeah. for your time. Uh, feel free to ask us any questions afterwards. And.